Thanks, Jason. Uh, as Jason mentioned, my name is Andy McDonald. I, um, I graduated from the University of Guelph in 1984 with a degree in crop science, of all things. Um, at that time, uh, I didn't really have any major intentions of starting a fencing company, but uh, I was a, a, a happy uh, university employee. I did have an amazing opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Ann Clark from about 1985 to 1989 on the uh, grazing management research facility at the Allura Beef Research Station. It was not my first time building fence, but it certainly was one of the larger projects that I was ever involved in. <coughs> Excuse me, and, and that project, the, uh, the research facility is actually still functioning now, and many of the fences we built back in about 1985, 1986, while they're des definitely in desperate need of repair, uh, they're still functioning for that, uh, for that system. Um, in uh, spring of, very early in the spring of 1989, I decided it was time to get away from the university. And so uh, myself and my family bought a farm up at the North End of Minto Township. And uh, at the same time, I, I got into the fencing in a serious sort of way and registered my business. <coughs> Back in the 1990s and early 2000s, high tensile electric was the big thing, the big new thing in the uh, in the industry, and so we we installed miles and miles of uh, high tensile electric fences. At that time, I wasn't really impressed with the quality in the high tensile woven fences, but the the old standard nine gauge was still a pretty decent fence. We did a bit of that as well. Uh, since then, the uh, the business has really kind of evolved. And now we do a lot of uh, board fence, uh, electric uh, braid fence for the horses, and uh, lots more of the woven and the, uh, the oak board. And the last few years, we've gotten into some commercial and some residential chain link and privacy fences as well. So it's been a real evolution over the last uh, 28 years. Uh, along with all of that, we also install water systems for uh, pasture, uh, animals on pasture. These are seasonal. Pass, uh, water systems that are either conventionally plumbed to uh, an existing system or uh, remotely plumbed to, say, uh, um, a well or a, uh, a creek and powered by uh, solar power. Uh, and again, a lot of what I do is, is helping folks like yourself develop a system that works for you on your farm. I, uh, I tell people one of the greatest things is at the end of the day, I get to leave and you have to stay. Yeah, swap it. Okay, thanks on top. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I get to leave. So let's build a system that you like, a system that works for you. And by the time I leave, we'll make sure it's working, but uh, it, I leave it in your hands. Uh, because there was a few more hours left in every day, I decided that um, we should do some farming as well. I do have 60 acres of intensively managed pasture on the farm in, in Minto Township. Um, 140 acres total left on the farm. On those 60 acres, we, we custom graze uh, between 60 and 80 head of uh, usually Angus calves, bring them in in that 600 pound range and hopefully see them leave in the 900 pound range. And in the last couple of years too, we've kind of gotten into the freezer business, the freezer beef business. So uh, we'll ship um, between 70 and 80 quarters of beef a year directly to, uh, to uh, freezers. Um, yeah, I think that's about everything about me and back to Jason. Okay, thank you. So we'll hold the uh, questions till everybody's introduced themselves here. Um, and next up we have Noel Johnson from Modern Fencing. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, my name's Noel Johnson from Modern Fencing, a division of B&L Farm Services. You might have heard of B&L Farm Services. We're a Wallenstein feed dealer. We sell uh, corn byproducts. And uh, so 1985, my father and a partner, the BNDL of B&L Farm Services, thought they needed to do something else for our truck driver and part-time employee. So they thought maybe they should start fencing our own farms. Um, so they, they got into the Gallagher high tensile fence, and I can remember being 13 and 14 years old, and they used to have the eucalyptus um, droppers, or little pound droppers for spacers in between. 
Well, I think that's all we did for a couple summers, and our hands were blistered. And I remember thinking, fencing's not fun at all. I don't want a fence. But I went to the school of hard knocks, so I guess we stayed fencing. <laughs> I never did anything but drive truck or build fence. So now today, um, we do we do do a lot of fencing. I have seven guys. All they do is fence from April till this year, December 23rd, even though they're whining because it was snowing. Jason, we won't be fencing this week. They said they're done till March. Um, so um, that's what we do. So when we first started, my dad and his partner each had 100 acres. We divided their farms up into 10 or 11 um, paddocks. And I think on the 80 acres of my f dad's farm, he put 100 uh, Charlet steers out there. And the only thing we did do wrong is put the water system at the front of the farm so the cattle, they had to walk to the front of the farm every day. And uh, then we learned over the years with different systems to take water to them. But we did put 100 head of cattle on there for almost 30 years after that. My father just sold the farm last year and moved to town. So it, it does work. Um, with the sheep fence, I can build any kind of fence. We've built fence for sheep, dogs, marijuana is the new thing. I got 4,000 feet over in Tiverton of eight foot fence with razor wire. We were one of the first people to put razor wire in anything but a penitentiary. So we, we learn and adapt. Um, tennis courts, we built chain link fence around a 100 acre farm. We did 100 acres and six foot chain link. So you ask us, we can do it. We did that in 15 days. I think I had nine guys do that, two quit after the, two, uh, the 15 days, but we did get it done. So um, yeah, we do the farm fence. Our farm fence is a lot of spring and fall. Um, we put a, up here, I say up here, anywhere north of here, we put our posts in with a backhoe. We have a pounder in the back of our backhoe. We pound the posts in, and uh, we try to get that done in the spring, and then everything else in the fall. But we do do it, anything from chain link fence and in the backyard, board fence, we can do it. Um, this is just a list of some things we've done. Uh, rail fence, page wire, barbed wire, um, anything. Every farm's different, so if someone comes to me and says, how much is it going to cost? I can give you a, an idea for budget, but I like to come to everybody's place, and Andy will say that. Every farm's different. We need to see, you know, what's going on. One thing I can do today that my father couldn't do 30 years ago, I can go on Google Maps and measure your farm pretty quick, other than walking around with an old wheel like we used to do. So, you, you know, technology's better. There are better systems now. Um, so, yeah, that, um, that's, that's um, the things we do. And we're just based out of Chesley. We are a Gallagher dealer. And uh, we can build any kind of fence for you. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Noel. Next up, we have uh, our uh, rep uh, on behalf of OMAF, Christina Riley. She's our forage and grazier specialist. Thanks, Jason. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Christine. I'm the forage and grazing specialist. And I thought, by way of introducing myself, I was going to. I'm going to talk a little bit about things to think about when you're choosing a fence and how to use a fence to make your operation run a little bit more smoothly. So to get started, there are two types of fence, perimeter and interior. So the perimeter fence is just like it sounds. It goes around the outside of the pasture. It's usually permanent, and it's your first line of defense against predators. So when you're trying to decide what sort of a fence, and our fencing contractors have talked about all kinds already, um, I would strongly encourage you to consider this piece of what I call old farmer advice. So this is words of wisdom from people who've had to install fences before. And the saying is, build your fences horse high, sheep tight, and bull strong. Now, we don't have as many mixed farms around as we did when this was commonly said advice. But the idea is make sure it's high enough nothing's going to jump over, small enough nothing's going to go through it, and strong enough that it's not going to fall down. Another way to phrase this is just to ask yourself the question, can you sleep at night? If you're lying awake worrying because there might be sheep on the road in the morning when you go to feed them, or there might be a few too many coyotes in that field, it's probably not a good fence. 
no matter what the salesman told you about buying or about that fence when you bought it or what kind of money you paid, if you can't sleep at night, it is not a good perimeter fence. Moving on to interior fencing. So the interior fences are the ones that you're using to subdivide those pastures into areas that make grazing management easier. So these can be permanent, they can be semi-permanent, and they, or they could be temporary depending on your management style, um, the area you have available, and how you plan on managing those pastures. So the key for grazing management is to avoid overgrazing. But how do you do that? Because it's one thing to give that as a recommendation, but it's another to actually put it into practice. So I would encourage you to not be a bad house guest as an easy way to remember how to avoid overgrazing. Because house guests, bad house guests have two traits in common. They either overstay their welcome or they come back too soon. So to keep your livestock from being from overgrazing your pasture, you don't want to let them be bad house guests. You want to make sure that you don't leave them in a paddock too long, and you want to make sure that they don't come back too soon. What does that look like for sheep? So to make sure your sheep are not overstaying their welcome, you want to take them out of that paddock when your grass is no shorter than two and a half inches. Funny enough, I think we learned earlier this afternoon, homunculus can only climb two and a half inches. So right away you can see a benefit because if that grass is not overgrazed, if it's not too short, your sheep are going to be picking up less gastrointestinal parasites from the pasture that they're grazing. As far as not coming back too soon, grass should be approximately 12 centimeters tall, so four and three quarters inches when you put your sheep back in. And the reason for that comes down to balancing, letting that grass have enough time to recover and making sure that it's still a height where sheep um, are comfortable. They can see if there is a predator or a dog or a person approaching. They also can maximize their bite size and those plants are still in a, a growing green vegetative stage. So they're very palatable, they're delicious. There's lots of nutrition in those plants. So this is a slide that I borrowed from James Byrne. He's our newest beef cattle specialist, but in a previous role before he moved to Canada, he worked with the Irish government as a beef and sheep extension personnel. So this slide is actually summarizing some research from the Athenry station in Ireland. And what they did is they looked at post-grazing residual grass heights. So how tall the grass should be when you pull your sheep out. And uh, if we look at this, I mean, obviously Ireland is a milder climate than ours. Please, please don't try grazing in March. That, that's probably too soon. But the idea here is that early in the year, it's possible to graze a little bit tighter because the grass is growing faster. By the time you get to July, August, that summer slump where the grass slows down, you're gonna need to leave a bit more residual, a bit more leaf matter, so that that grass has the leaf area to capture sunlight, to produce those sugars, and to recover from being grazed faster. So it's possible to graze a little bit tighter in the spring and leave a little bit more residue in the summer and into the fall to make sure that your pastures are recovering quickly from being grazed. This is another one of James's slides. Um, to summarize his bullet points, he starts off by saying, measuring your grass height is the most important part of management. And what we're talking about here is not going out with a ruler and lying on your belly and trying to figure out exactly how tall every single blade of grass is, because that's a bit ridiculous. But what I would like you to do is to go out and walk in your pastures and really notice how tall that grass is. Um, one thing that I've seen some farmers do that's really successful with this, if you take a pair of rubber boots and a permanent marker or some paint and you actually draw on the boot how high is six centimeters, that two and a half inches, how high is 12 centimeters, that four and three quarters inches. And if you walk through, you can just kind of take a look down and see, hmm, this grass is approximately the height that I need to pull my sheep out. Or this grass, you know what, it's, it's about where I want it. I can put my sheep in this paddock next. Okay, it's an easy way to measure, and it means that you actually are aware of what's going on. And this doesn't have to be an extra thing on your to-do list. If you're going out to check waters, water troughs, if you're going out to check your sheep, if you're checking fences, if you're feeding the guardian dogs, whatever chores you have to do in those paddocks anyway, 
This is something you can do while you're walking out to do it, or when you jump off the four-wheeler to go do it. So the table at the bottom of this slide is looking at when you put lambs into a paddock, how tall that grass is, and the live weights per game that the researchers at Athen Rye saw. So as you can see, if you put those lambs in and the grass is only four centimeters high, they only gained 267 grams a day. But when the grass was nine centimeters high, the lambs were grazing an average of 315 grams per day. Um, by the time that grass height hit 12 centimeters, the gains per day started to peak. And that was partly because uh, at, once the grass gets above 12 centimeters, they start lying on it, they trample it a bit more. They're not using as much of the grass, so that's why those gains start to plateau. Interior fencing, um, a little bit more on paddock design. This is, these numbers are coming from Richard Teague. He's an environmental researcher out of the States, and he and his colleagues are doing a lot of work on carbon sequestration in grasslands. So they're working with some really progressive grazing managers, ranchers, um, across North America, but also around the world. And when they surveyed them to ask about important things to consider in grazing management, this is what the farmers they're working with said. They said that you need a minimum of 10 paddocks to prevent overgrazing. And this one, I can tell you exactly why. So, does anyone know how many days it takes for a grass plant to start to regrow after it's been grazed? Anyone want to take a guess? Somebody said 14. 14. 14. Any other guesses? Two, seven. Seven. Two, seven. Okay. The answer is within five. So sometime between the day it was grazed and five days after it was grazing, a grass plant's going to start to regrow. So it's going to mobilize whatever energy it's stored in its roots and try to get a new leaf produced as fast as possible. So if you have 10 paddocks, let's say you leave your sheep in, those, in a paddock for five days. It's going to take you 50 days to get back to the first paddock you started in. For most of the year, that would be enough time for that grass to rest and recover and get back to your 12 centimeters, except maybe in the dry part of the summer. What if you decided on the same piece of land to have lots more sheep, but only leave them in the paddock for one day? Graze one day, nine days, you're back where you started. That pasture has not recovered yet. There's no way it's 12 centimeters. I don't care if it's May and it's growing super fast. It's just not going to happen. So that's why Richard's research, Richard Teague's research is saying that you need a minimum of 10 paddocks. If you can't support your flock on the land base that you have and divide it into 10 paddocks, then the only way around it would be to pull them off and feed them in a dry lot or a barn for however many days it takes to make it feel like you have 10 paddocks from the grasses perspective. Does that make sense? The other numbers here, so his next point is that you need four, yep. Question at the back. Yep. That's based on how many sheep per acre? That, it doesn't, so the, the sheep per acre would depend very much where you are. So the number of paddocks is not set on an acre, right? So they're, they're talking to grazing managers all across North America. So if you're in a very arid environment, some of those guys, I mean, your stocking density is going to be much lower because your grass isn't producing as much, right? So um, it'll depend a lot on, on how productive those fields are, but sizing it would, would depend mostly on that. So if we could hold questions till we get to the panel part, I'm happy to answer them then, but I'll, we'll try to get through this. Um, so your other two points, uh, to really support animal production, you probably need more than 10 paddocks just because it allows for longer rest periods to get that grass to recover. And uh, the last point about improving rangeland is really seeing environmental benefits from rotational grazing is things like um, cleaner water, habitat for grassland birds and pollinators. That really comes out when you have more paddocks and you can give them adequate rest. Another feature to consider when you're putting in a fence are gates. They're often the weak point in your fence. So really make sure that when they're being installed, they're both tight to the ground and to the fence posts they're mounted on. Uh, particularly pay attention to things like tractor ruts because wheel ruts are a great way for either sheep to get out or other things to get in. Um, and be conscious of the spacing of whatever is in the middle of that fence. So um, this chain link is a fantastic example because nothing's gonna get through it. But if you had bars 
um, or, or wires on there that were further apart. Just be aware of what might be able to fit through. If you put your gates in corners, stockmanship gets easier because uh, it helps funnel sheep in towards the gate when you're moving paddocks. Uh, if you have the option to put it slightly down slope, that'll also help with sheep flow and getting them to go where you need them to go. Uh, but the mo one of the most effective ways to move sheep between paddocks is provide them with an incentive. If they know they're going to get fed, they're going to have fresh grass in the next field, and they're hungry, that is a great motivator to get them to go where you want them to go. Like this. So we have one farmer, one dog, a gate in a corner that is slightly downhill from this paddock, and the sheep are moving through very smoothly into their next field. So my take home message is that good grazing management is proactive. It's about planning ahead and having enough paddocks that you have some options for where you're going to put those sheep. Uh, please start thinking about how tall your grass is and taking those measurements on a regular basis so that you can make those planning decisions and you can manage based on actually the weather conditions and what's happening in your fields. And then hopefully you can also choose a fencing system that enables you to make those changes. So thank you, and I'll give us back to Jason. Okay, so we're gonna move them up on the uh, stage here now and uh, open the floor up for some questions. So if anybody has any questions uh, burning. We will take them momentarily here. So any burning questions out there? Anything uh, when any one of our panelists were, were introducing themselves as to what you're wanting to uh, gain as far as education? Or Before we move into questions, I'll just mention that we did provide you some extra slides on your handouts that includes details about the different types of fencing, pros and cons, as well as some pricing analysis that was given to us by Andy and Noel. So if you have any questions on those particular slides, you can also ask those questions during the panel. Any questions at all out there? Okay. That's why I sit at the front. I always got one question. There seems to be a wide variety of different woven wire fences the last few years. Uh, who, which, which one are you saying is going to be around here in the 20 years, like uh, you said uh, when you built your first? Because it used to be you get the old standard eight wire or nine wire, and now I go in and well, do you want this one or that one? I don't know which one's right, so I'm curious. Eight forty-two was big around here. It was cattle fence basically. Uh, there's nine forty-eight. That's nine and three quarters. But the sheep fence, everybody can go. If you want to say you go in somewhere, it's Keystone Red Top, um, four by four sheep fence. If it's built right, it should be here in 30 years. I was just pricing someone last week, and he's asked a lot of questions about 30 years, and he was 58 years old with his son. I said, I don't think you need to worry about it, but your son may have to worry about it. If it's built right, it should be up here in 30 years. You're going to have to maintain it, but, you know, with the right, right installation, it's a pretty good, and the 4x4 four four square is way better than the old 842 for sheep. I would agree with that, Don, too, that, that the, uh, the, 840, the uh, 1348, which is the 4x4 four four square, is uh, galvanizing on the wire as a class 3 as opposed to a class 2, which is the old standard for the 842. And the 125 uh, gauge high tensile wires now are a lot stronger, especially when you're considering snow load and any kind of impact, we'll say, round bales, tractors, things like that. Um, there's, it's much more forgiving than the old the old nine and three quarter gauge wires were. So I, I would agree that uh, a 1348, <clears throat> it's a little more expensive than an 842. But even a lot of the 842s now, they're down to a one foot uh, spacing on the vertical wires. So it's good for the sheep, it's not so good for the lamb. Lambs can still get through. Uh, there's a four by four and a six by six 
version of that uh, that woven wire. They're both very good. Question back here. Yeah, just looking for discussion on um, making a fence. Uh, tips for making fence to deter coyotes. Not let's just assume we can't do predator proof, but tips on uh, fences that deter predators. Um, again, I would stick with something like a, a, a 1348. Um, leave it about only about two or three inches off the ground so that your bottom wire isn't in, in contact with the soil all the time. Um, we have built uh, fences with live wires actually on the outside at the top and, and halfway up. So it means clearing out a bit more space on the outside of the, the footprint of the, the fence. But putting the, if, it, if your biggest problem is keeping the coyotes or the dogs off the farm, then go ahead and put your electric on the outside of your fence. Um, there's also some incentive to maybe put a live wire about six inches off the ground so that when that coyote comes up to, to test out the fence, he gets a shock when he starts. If he tries to dig in, he's still going to get a shock. Um, if he's got good contact with the soil and you've got a good high-powered fencer, then that can be a real deterrent. Um, also, if, if that is still not solving the problem, if, if you get your neighbors are telling you that, that that's not working, then theoretically you could even dig a trench around the outside of the, the fence and bury uh, chicken wire or some other wire in the first foot or two. The coyotes aren't going to dig a whole lot deeper than that. So that would give you some physical, uh, a physical barrier as well. Now the other way to look at it is sort of from the, from the different angle that if you have a coyote um, near your farm and that coyote is not bothering your lambs, then whatever you do, don't get rid of that coyote. Because the coyotes are very territorial and the uh, environmental, or the uh, ministry, ministry of the Environment guys will tell you that the best way to control uh, predation can be by using their natural instincts not to uh, cross each other's land and not to uh, move into an area that uh, already has a coyote in it. So two designs that have had a bit of research go into them to help prevent coyotes from getting into a field. Um, there was some work done in Alberta for a nine strand high tensile wire and I believe at the back we have, yeah, we've got some copies of uh, what that spacing actually is between those nine strands at the back corner at the OMAFRA table. So there's some information on how to build one of them. Um, another design that is relatively predator resistant is using that um, woven wire that's designed for sheep, so like the, the four inch by four inch uh, wire, and then adding a hot wire, adding two hot wires on the top as well to help make it harder for coyotes to climb or jump over the fence. So those are two other designs that uh, will help prevent coyotes from getting access to your pasture. Okay. Um, in your handout there, you'll see different styles of fencing and there's uh, some costing that uh, both the suppliers here uh, or the installers have provided. I was just gonna get them to comment maybe on uh, the high tensile one to start. Noel or Andy. Let me just, the high tensile, yeah, Andy and I were both asked to give our opinion and some prices and uh, when we did, the first time we met was today, our prices are pretty close but like I said, they range depending what you do in each farm. Um, the six wire, um, I had five to seven, Andy had five to seven. I say, I price everything in rod, it's kind of old school here, Chesley North, um, so if it, a rod 16 and a half feet for people that don't know, so 44 to 48 dollars a rod for five to seven strand there's there's um could be on that say seven strand there could be four or five live ones and a couple dead ones just to uh, help the shock um that's that'd be putting a post every 30 feet um depending on the lay of the land um everything would be would be done gates and energizers and brace panels would be extra but um when we're talking about coyotes there, just, down the road from our farm, we had a coyote farm, if you can believe it. I wouldn't want to be a sheep farmer near them, but a guy actually housed coyotes for hunters. So this fence was built with, with actually two-by-two two spacing wire, and 
two hot wires to keep the coyotes in. So neighbors weren't happy about it. <laughs> and I'd probably say he did a pretty good job. Maybe 5% of the coyotes would get out because I'd see them at our farm catching them, staring them, or shooting them. So, But it does, does work pretty good that way. Um, and I just think sleeping at night, I like I like the sheep and sheep and goat fence they call it now the best way, but for the better costs, um, the high tensile wire, it's it just all depends how you build it, and uh, the cleaning the path and having um, the access to to maintain it, you know, a couple times a year, spring and fall, um, just to keep it going. Andy, any comments there with uh, your pricing? I think uh, yeah, Noel hit it right on the head there. You're, you're looking at, he and I can give you sort of a budget price, but I would hate for someone to call us up in the spring and say, hey, you said in January that it would be this much. Uh, we both have a, a very bad habit of wanting to see the, the project before we agree to a price. And that's simply because there, every farm is different. That uh, if you get down into Huron County um, or even Southern Wellington County, it, it's fairly flat. And so we don't have to consider the extras that have to go into a fence. Um, up here in Bruce County, Gray County, Northern Wellington County, we have to consider the fact that that land is not level and it takes more posts to go over the hill and back down again. Um, even Google Maps, uh, Noel mentioned about Google Maps, we can sit in our desks and, at this time of year and say, okay, here's the fence that we need to build. But even if you look on Google Maps, it'll give you two distances when you when you stretch that line out. One is the vertical, one is the, uh, aerial distance and one is the actual distance and so Google Maps has now started to take into effect that there are elevation changes from one end of a farm to the other okay we, we've known that for years because the fence just doesn't stretch that far we have to we have to account for that and put in extra posts or extra braces extra time extra materials and so that's all something that we could we could sit down at your table with you and say this is what uh, today we can tell you what to budget as far as going home and figuring out a, a distance or a, a length or a price. But uh, before either one of us would start a job, we want to see it and say, okay, well, you forgot about that, but I need to consider that. So there, there, there's, there's a lot of leeway that we need to before we start. Any questions or comments with regards to the high tensile? Okay, we'll move uh, next up there. We've got some predator resistant fencing uh, pricing there. Maybe if I get just east one of you to uh, comment on what you'd outlaid here as well. I, I think, uh, yeah, we've kind of hit on that. The, a basic price is, is what we would give you for a, for a standard, um, for standard, say, a, an eight, a 1348 fence. Uh, we build lots of that. We know what it, it should cost. We know what our inputs are. and We, we know hey, we got to make a bit of money, extra money at the end of the, the, uh, the, year, the day or the year, or we won't be here next year. Um, if you have a major predator problem, then we can add things to your fence to make it work better. Um, we can put in a more higher, a higher powered fencer, for instance, but a higher powered fencer then requires more ground rods. So there's a lot of things that, that uh, I mean, what's there, about 60 years of experience up here. Uh, um, as far as every different kind of fence and every different kind of situation. So as far as predator resistant, yeah, we've talked about some different styles, but every farm is different. So every farm needs a little bit of extra consideration or doesn't need as much consideration depending on whether your neighbor's lambs are tastier than your, your lambs, things like that. I missed the tasty lamb today. I didn't come for lunch, so I guess I'm not much of a predator today. Um, yeah, our prices were pretty spot on. What I do here, six inch posts every rod, three wood stakes in between. Um, difference of the, of the the 1348, like the couple inches, the old page wire, I was always taught, top of our work boot, that's where the bottom of the wire goes, and we were setting fence, that's what we did. Uh, we weren't thinking about pre predators. Um, but that, that's the big thing, and keeping it tight. So not only is it good for predators, but it's got a longevity, so it's there for 30-some years for you. You know, you may have to add that hot wire next year or in two months. Who knows? You, you'll find that out, too, if uh, some new coyote comes to town and wants to 
head across the fence to you. So yeah, everything's everything's different, and I do like to look at. I was looking at a farm last week in the snow, and I was shaking my head, but at least I could see the elevations, and you know, there's no trees, there's no rocks, and I can give someone a good budget price or a price. Wires going up a little bit here. I haven't bought any yet. I usually do that in March. It seems to go up every year. <laughs> they say, oh, wire's going up. You better buy it today. So a roll of that 1348 is going to be more in April than it is today. Okay, any other questions as we go along? We've got lots of other things we can cover up here, but if you have any other questions, feel free to share them out. Uh, as far as uh, grounding and Wendy, you just touched on a little bit, but uh, any recommendations or sort of rules of thumb in terms of grounding your fences? Yeah, absolutely. Um, about, I, I guess, let's not say about it, let's say this is the rule of thumb. Um, for every two joules of, ener of energy that your fencer is putting out, you need six feet of ground rod. Um, back in the old days when a, a three joule or a six joule fencer was a high powered fencer, we would put uh, three ground rods down and everything would be fine. Uh, a lot of the companies now have 25 and 50 and is there a 100 joule now? I think, I think Gallagher has a 100 joule fencer. Um, I wouldn't recommend anybody go out and buy one um, unless you have 1,000 or 2,000 acres that you want to, want to work on. Uh, for an average sized uh, farm, say uh, uh, 20 to 20 to 40 acres of pasture. I would suggest you start with about a six or a 12 joule fencer. I use a 12 joule fencer at home on my uh, 60 acres of pasture, and I can maintain. Uh, that's not sheep fence; it's it's cattle fence. Uh, but I can maintain about 7,000 volts on that fence all the time. On my 12 joule fencer, I've got eight ground rods because I've gone a little bit higher than the necessary, and I may want to expand in the future, so I've gone a little bit higher than the, the requirement. Along with that, uh, that grounding system, you want to tie in your lightning diverter. Uh, fencers are not cheap. They represent a fairly major investment in, in your fence. Um, 12 joule fencers are now about $1,100. Um, 100 joule fencers, you're probably looking at $2,500. Um, a lightning diverter is 40. And even though most of these fencers come with a, a, a warranty that includes lightning damage, you're still better off to have that $40 diverter there because it protects everything beyond your fencer as well. Uh, but yeah, the number one failure of, of most fencers, um, and I've seen this over the years, I'm sure Noel has too, is that people simply don't put in, a, in enough grounding. It does come back and it does bite you in the butt if you don't, that, that's almost guaranteed. I have seen um, uh, an instance in uh, Hanover here, uh, oh, many years ago anyway, but the, the owner put an aluminum ladder up against the eaves trough in the house to clean the, the uh, leaves out of the gutter. And he got 1,100 volts of shock off the eaves trough on his house because the grounding hadn't been done right. So like I say, it can come back and it can get you lots of different ways. I just remember my father, I was 15 years old, and he was a Gallagher dealer, shaking his head at other fence dealers. They, these people would spend all the money on their fence, buy a fencer, which was, say it was 500 bucks, and buy one ground rod, and that was the biggest mistake. Then they'd shake their head, and we'd go out there after, probably with half a dozen ground rods in our truck and, and a pounder, and fix it up pretty quick. So yeah, that's always been an issue. Question, front here, Don? It stand? I don't want to stand up. Do I have to? <laughs> um, pasture. There's some salesmen recommend in our pasture we have a high percentage grass. They're saying use a turf grass fertilizer mixture. Give us a slow release. Is it worth the extra cost or not? So there has been some research done comparing slow release nitrogen versus urea, which is generally not a slow release nitrogen source. And the best results have actually been by using a combination of the two. And the reason for that is that some of that nitrogen is available right away, and then you get the trickle 
throughout the rest of the season rather than all of it being delayed or all of it being available relatively soon after you apply. Um, as far as nitrogen fertilizer goes on your pasture, if you have more than 30% legumes in your pasture, so legumes are your clovers, alfalfa, bird's foot trefoil, uh, plants like that, then those plants form symbiotic relationships with bacteria in the soil, and those bacteria take nitrogen gas out of the air and make it available to your plant. So it's the closest thing you will get to having free nitrogen fertilizer is by having legumes in your pasture. If you have a lot of legumes and you apply nitrogen fertilizer, the plants go, I don't need these bacteria, and they get lazy and they stop that relationship. So you actually lose that ability to fix nitrogen if you apply nitrogen fertilizer to a pasture that has lots of legumes. If your pasture is mostly grass, grasses need a lot of nitrogen. So when, you're, when you have a grass legume mix, the grasses are borrowing excess nitrogen from what the legumes are fixing. If you don't have those legumes, those grasses need nitrogen. So general recommendation would be in the spring around green up, um, no more than 45 pounds an acre to just help get that grass going and give it the nutrition it needs to build proteins as it's growing very quickly. Um, if you're in a rotational grazing system, you could apply maybe 20 pounds an acre of nitrogen after each graze, but you wanna make sure that um, you're paying attention to weather conditions that you're, you're not at risk of nitrate poisoning if those grasses are growing very quickly and you're grazing at the same time. So there's, there's a bit of um, an art to it, it's like do pay attention to what's happening with the weather, but that's kind of general for nitrogen. For phosphorus and potassium, your other two major plant nutrients, those tend to be most helpful in the early fall. So at the start of what's known as the critical fall harvest period for alfalfa. So in this part of the province, it would probably be early September, but I would have to look at the, the chart to, to confirm that. Uh, but basically, it's six weeks before your average killing frost hits. That's the start of that critical fall harvest period. And it's those six weeks that your pasture plants are trying to build their root reserves to survive the winter. And if they survive the winter well and they've got a lot of energy stored in their roots, then they can bounce back and grow very quickly in the spring. So if you provide them with phosphorus and potassium as they're about to begin that process, then they're in a much better position to use those nutrients to help with that growth and that winter hardening before they go into dormancy for the winter. Can I just add one point to that? Jason, uh, hey Don, if you've got hilly pastures, then slow release nitrogen is not a good idea because it doesn't break down quickly. In a year like we had in 2017, it all washes down to the bottom of the hill. It's, it's not available to most of your pasture anyway. So you're better off to, to split your applications into maybe twice split uh, two applications a year if you're not going to go after every after every grazing but uh, stay with something like urea that that gets in the ground fast and available fast i guess the other challenge with fertilizing on pasture is if your plants are overgrazed in general plants have about as much root mass as they have top leaf material so if your grass plants are only this tall They've probably only got roots that go about that deep. And so they're not in a good position to make the most use of the fertilizer you're applying. So if you're struggling with grass yields because your pastures are overgrazed, if you decide to spend the money on fertilizer to get your dollar value, you're probably also going to have to tweak your grazing management so that your pasture gets enough rest time to build both its leaf material and its root material and actually use that fertilizer. Otherwise, you're just throwing money at a problem. Okay. Uh, a couple other things here we have uh, as far as interior fencing. What do you see the most of, or what uh, what's the most common types that uh, individuals are using there? What we've been doing is a lot of uh, um, high tensile in between too, but that's a lot more costly than the poly wire or even the flock fence. Um, we have a lot of people just buy the flock fence from something you can do yourself and put up 
And uh, actually, a lot of the interior fencing there there can be done. Gallagher keeps coming out with new new posts. Other companies do too, but uh, something that's easy to be installed by the producer themselves, which is going to reduce the cost. Having us there, you know, we can give recommendations and sell, and sell the material. But you need to put up what's right for you to be able to either move it or you know move your flock around or whatever's easy for putting up. So we see a lot of that flock fence or poly wire in these plastic posts? Um, I think it, it depends too on your intention. Um, is, it a, is this a 20 year pasture or is this a five year pasture? Um, I was saying to Christine earlier that some of my paddocks on my farm, uh, about 16 acres of my 60 are about 55 years in continuous pasture. I've, I've renovated and I've um, fertilized and I brought it up to where those those are my best paddocks. And so when I was doing my fencing, I went with a semi-permanent um, interior fence as opposed to a poly wire, simply because I wanted to get, I mean, it was, it's very hilly, so it, it needs to be in pasture. So I, uh, using a semi-permanent uh, 16 gauge high tensile wire is something that I, I put it up in the mid 90s and I'm still using it today. Now I can subdivide those, subdivide those paddocks again using poly wire or, or a netting if I had sheep, and that way I get absolutely the most use out of my paddocks. But uh, again, think about what your what your long term plans are. If it's if it's simply uh, say a, a field that you want to use for a few years, then go ahead and use stick with the poly wire. Uh, if you want to look uh, long term, say ten or twenty years, then go ahead and make the investment. Like Noel says, in that in that um, high tensile, the galvanized wire is gonna last you a lot longer. It's gonna stand up to the deer a lot better and, and it's gonna be much more usable uh, down the road. Uh, one thing, uh, another conversation we had earlier was uh, you know, regarding flock netting. You can buy it, it's not too bad, it's about a dollar a foot to buy it. But if you put it up and leave it there, then you're not gonna be happy with your return on that investment in that tool. If you take that flock netting and you subdivide your paddocks and you use it and move it every couple of days, use it like a tool. And then when it's worn out, when they're broken wires, when it's not conducting anymore, throw it out and get another one. Don't curse the guy that you bought it from because you didn't use it right. If you, if you use it like a tool, that's what it's intended for. Use it, move it. Uh, you'll probably get five good years out of it. And then by that time, it's, it's, you've been tying knots and the deer have maybe run through it or the sheep have been through it once or twice. Throw it out. Don't don't fight with it any longer. Just throw it out. And get yourself a new one. Make that make that investment in something that isn't nearly as uh, difficult to use. So for interior fencing, I really like semi-permanent and temporary fences because it gives you options, and having options really helps keep your grazing management system proactive where you're looking ahead, you're measuring, you're planning, okay, I think this is what my pastures are gonna look like in two weeks, rather than walking out the door one morning and your flocks bleeding their heads off because they're hungry and there's nothing to eat because you didn't notice that, oh wait, that pasture got grazed, and now you're reacting, you're going, okay, do I have enough hay to feed them? Am I gonna feed them in the field? Am I feeding them in the barn? If you're in reaction mode, you've already missed the boat and you're gonna be doing a lot more work to play catch up than if you were planning ahead and looking at what's the forecast, how's the grass growing, do I want to start supplementing feed before the sheep are making lots of noise because they're hungry. So um, for sheep, I mean, we've mentioned there's uh, electronetting, and that's one of the fencing types listed in your handout with pros and cons. With the poly wire, I know there are some products available that have multiple strands on um, like lightweight plastic stakes that you can run out as one unit for short spans. I've also seen um, some producers have rigged up like uh, a T-post that they've welded a couple of places where they can hang several single real poly wires on so that they can walk that out across their field and they're unrolling three strands of wire, two or three strands of wire at once instead of having to make multiple trips with single strands. So there are products available and there's also smart, creative farmer hacks to make moving temporary fences around much easier for multiple strands to help keep your sheep where you want them. Okay, Julie. I, oh, sorry. 
I just had a question now that we've gone to interior fencing. So somebody made the comment earlier that uh, it was good to bring the water to the livestock. So I was just wondering your comments on watering systems because we really don't want to be bringing the livestock back to the barn and alleyways where they're getting parasite loads. So mm -hmm. if we could take the li uh, water to the livestock and what kind of suggestions you have for, for that. I'll just make a quick comment. We don't do watering systems anymore. We used to do that. We do other things, and I like to stick what's good. But as a, a farmer, we did graze our own cattle and, and, and do our, our 10 paddocks and split them up. We just, we just uh, went with the water system. We had water for our cattle, so we just moved it with our loader and took the trough and had all our water lines run out, and pumping from a, a, a farm with hydro and a well that could push it out there. And um, we just took the water to them versus 30 years ago, we let the cattle walk the whole length of the 100 acre farm come up. So sheep, cattle, whatever, water is a very important thing. So that's all we did. And there's quick connect um, water fittings, um, UV in inhibited water line to uh, you can lay out and leave out in your pasture along your, I call it permanent interior fences. So that's what we did just as that's why I brought that up as our, our own a producer ourselves. But Andy, you do water systems. Yeah, I think Noel's got it right there. You just you lay down your your plastic line, uh, which is actually a line that was developed by the um, the maple syrup industry. So it is UV stabilized. It doesn't degrade. Um, again, I'm using some line now that that I originally installed back in 90, 1995 on this pasture. It's still the worst part of it is the the skunks and the the groundhogs that, that find it and chew holes in it. Um, what happens when you do lay it down inside your, uh, and like along the very base of a fence, that the grass grows up over top of it and then folds down over top of it that fall. And so lots of places I can't even find my water line anymore, but I know that's there because I've got water at the end. The cattle have water at the end. Um, I use a lot of three quarter inch line, but we also have available a one inch and an inch and a quarter line for longer distances. Uh, it's good to kind of sit down again this time of year and say, okay, I've got this many sheep that I need to provide water to. They're going to drink this much every day. I need to provide um, a trough that's big enough that um, will, will accommodate those, that number of animals. I have to make sure that my well is recharging fast enough. I have to make sure that the pump at the house or at the barn is, is capable of pushing that extra water that extra distance. <clears throat> the nice thing about um, having them set up like this with the, the above ground hydrants is that you can move a trough or a series of troughs with the animals through your paddocks. Uh, I think I mentioned I have 17 paddocks on my uh, 60 acres that I rotate the cattle through. Um, there are five spots where I have hydrants hooked up in that water line and each of those hydrants uh, will supply f at least three or four different paddocks simply because of the way I sat down and designed it. Uh, I have that, the, the trough is attached to a 50 foot flexible hose. So it can go in one corner, one paddock, and then and when the cattle move to the next paddock, I simply dump out the trough and, and move it uh, under the fence to the next paddock. I don't even have to disconnect it from the hydrant. If they move to the next area, then I disconnect, drag it in behind them, plug it back in, and within a couple of minutes, that trough is full. The other benefit of doing it that way is that um, like Noel said, in the old days when all the cattle moved to the front of the farm to, to get water, they all came at once. So the dominant cows, or in this case the dominant sheep, would get water. They'd hang around for a bit, and by the time that trough had filled enough times for the lesser cows or the lesser yos to, to actually get a drink, the dominant ones had gone back. And so that herding instinct would, want, would, would force those uh, less dominant animals to follow before they actually got the drink that they needed. When you have water available in the paddock with those animals all the time, they come in ones and twos. And so your trough is never down by more than a few inches as long as your pump is able to keep up. So it's a very different uh, kind of a, an, an approach and, and the whole idea of those animals not having adequate water um, every day is, is a thing of the past. And, and just one more, I mean, it's our customers and our, our friends that teach us the most. I had uh, one customer over in, in the Grand Valley area with uh, about 1,100 yos on grass. 
and he always assumed that the grass would just provide enough water when it was growing adequately and there was enough rainfall. Um, but he did decide he would try it, and, and, and before he bought a system from us, he went out with a 1,000-gallon um, water trough, and it was hooked up to, sorry, water tank, and it was hooked up to, sorry, 1,000 liters. Um, no, sorry, I'm wrong. It was a 1,000-gallon tank hooked up to two different troughs, and those 1,100 yos drained that tank in a day, which was a real eye-opener for him because he had no idea that they were that short of water while they were full of grass that um, they could drink that much more. So they, again, that was an easy sell. The, uh, the sheep did all the work for me on that one. So with water systems in pasture, as far as running lines, there's, there's kind of two options. So they've talked about running lines above ground and with above ground lines, things that I love about them, they're much more flexible. So if you need to change things around, whether you're moving a semi-permanent fence or whatever, you can, you can much more easily move those lines. Um, they tend to be less expensive than underground water lines. And it's usually easier to find a problem. If a line bursts, you can find the leak much more quickly than if the break is underground. So if you are deciding to install water lines underground, um, they're permanent and you need to make sure they're below the, free, the frost line. So they're gonna be down where the ground is not going to freeze. Um, Noel mentioned quick connectors. Those make moving water troughs around so much easier because you're not trying to screw the hose connectors together, which never seem to go nicely the first three times you try it. So the quick connect makes that really smooth and easy. Um, and I guess the last point I'd like to make is for colder weather, when animals are out on pasture. Um, it actually takes less energy to move water than to heat water. So if you're trying to prevent a water trough from freezing, that's worth taking into consideration. So I don't, I don't have a huge amount of suggestions on how to make that work. Um, I do know one example out in Alberta, there's a producer that had um, on their ranch, their water source for their livestock were, was dugout ponds. So he put a milk crate over a sump pump and s dropped it into the pond and basically pumped the pond water into the trough and then had an overflow that would overflow back down into the pond. And because the water was moving, even though it was as cold as today, the trough didn't freeze because it was going back down into the pond under the ice. So that, that constant circulation kept it from freezing even though it was very, very cold. And that used less fuel than running a heater would have. So every setup is different. Um, I don't have any plans, like uh, written designs for you on how you might set something like that up, but I wanted to give you that piece of information so that you can put your practical creative minds to work and maybe come up with something to help your water systems in late fall or early spring outdoor situations. Question in front? Well, it was not really a question, it was more a comment. I know my father did uh, a line, he ran an interior line inside the main water line and that circulated the water through the barn and all he had to do was unthaw the float bowl in the water trough because there wasn't enough heat in the barn uh, from the cattle to keep the water going. So he ran a circulating line that would be constantly running that water in the line so it wouldn't freeze. So that's one idea. Thanks for sharing. That's really interesting. Okay. I've got one more here, and then if nobody else has anything, I think we'll call it a day shortly here. But um, So we've talked a lot about new or uh, near new fences, I think. Uh, any tips from our panelists here on rejuvenating old fences, trying to extend the life of our existing fences? <laughs> That's what I was thinking as a fence guy. I hate looking at old fences, but I say I'm not the one that has to spend the money, but a high hole sure does a nice job starting fresh. <laughs> really good job, yeah. Um, there's some fences that can be saved. Um, you know, maybe it was an old page wire fence. You clean up some of the scrub and some brush and stuff, and you can use some high tensile um, offsets or, you know, single to double, triple lines to get another five to ten years out of it, you're probably going to be 
pulling off broken wires on your high tensile that are snapping and stuff. Been there, done that. Um, um, that's one thing you can do. If it's an old barbed wire fence that's in the trees, I'd say the high hose is the best, <laughs> the best idea. Uh, yeah, the, the biggest risk of trying to um, renovate a really old fence is that it is brittle. And uh, even after the, the, uh, the high hose been through and cleared out a really nice working area for us, we can put up a nice, really good electric fence for you. And within a year or two, you'll find that old wire is with the frost and everything else is coming up out and hitting your fence. Um, sometimes you just get to that point where you're better off just to start new. Um, again, it, it's, somebody mentioned earlier, that guy over there, he was talking about it, quality of life, and, and how much time do you want to spend walking your fence lines looking for a problem? Um, in, in whatever we do, it, it's a matter of, that like you, you folks trust us to come up with good ideas, we trust you to come up with answers and, and uh, support us when, when we're finished. Um, but at the end of the day, the decisions are yours. Uh, the investment is yours. We're here to help you make it. Um, neither one of us would ever lead, lead you astray on purpose. So if you asked us to, to try to fix up a 40-year-old woven wire fence or up in Bruce County, there are literally, there must be 5 million miles of, of old barbed wire fence. You really can't do a lot with it once it gets brittle. And once it's turned brown from rust, it started, it's, its life is more than half done at that point in time. So you really want to say, you know, where am I going to put my investment? Am I going to try to get two more years out of this thing and then, you know, finally give up on it? Or do I say, okay, I'm going to say this is the year we, we start new. Um, that decision is yours. We, we can give you some guidance. We can give you some ideas. But, but that decision is ultimately uh, with the landowner. Okay. Any other last questions? One here in the middle. Last run of the day. <laughs> if you're building your own fence, I know you guys all use peeled posts. Peeled posts or non-peeled posts, is there a difference in the life expectancy on those? Absolutely. Um, you get that bark off that cedar post, um, and that post has a better chance of drying out in the ground. Um, that, that bark will decay very slowly and hold a lot of bacteria to the post right from the top to the bottom. Okay, so you're going to see a, a, a post that goes in with the bark attached is going to be gone very quickly. I'd also say too, I mean, you use six inch posts. Uh, we use a lot of six inch posts, a lot of large five inch posts. Um, often on Kijiji, there are great deals on four inch posts because none of us can really use them. They don't drive very well. Uh, they tend to break underneath the, the weight of the post driver and uh, they don't last very long. A, a four inch post will probably last you five to 10 years, um, but we're building 20 and 30 year fences. So we'll use four inch posts for stakes. We'll use uh, five and six inch posts for line posts and, and the the really critical posts in your fence are the brace posts and the anchor posts and the gate posts, and we'll typically go six to eight inches on those. Uh, it takes a lot longer to put them in, but they're, like I say, they're, they're the critical posts in your fence. I No, I agree. I, I have people that have um, some peel posts, and I'll send them somewhere with a peeler, and maybe for a dollar a post they can get them peeled and, you know, it's done. You don't have to worry about it. Um, if you're building a high tensile fence with posts that aren't peeled, the bark falls off it too and shorts things out. There's other problems too. But yeah, I've we've tried to uh, cheap out and experiment at our own farms too. And even with five inch posts, my brother, young guy trying to to uh, fence a hundred acres with page wire. Okay, let's put a six inch post, five inch post, six inch post. Well, in twelve years, those five inch posts, I can pretty much body check all them over and they were peeled too so um, th that's it's a little more costs but let's do it right even with the stakes I've seen guys put up one inch stakes they're just about all's left is the staple gonna fall out too so yeah it, it costs a bit right up front but to do it right 
And personally, if people want me to do stuff like that, I, I'm busy enough, I just walk away because I'm not going to build a fence that's not going to be around. Okay. I think at that, we'll wrap up our panelists. So uh, please show your appreciation for our panelists here today. And thank you, everyone. And thank you.